Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is on assignment tonight. They are off to Beijing in just days, but some Canadian athletes may not even be allowed into China. They're being extra cautious. What CBC has learned about the strict COVID testing policy that could dash some Olympic hopes. The big dig. I never, never seen this much uh, delays. The messy cleanup, closing schools, cutting transit. And no, it's not over yet. Why major American airlines say 5G technology could ground planes. Could Omicron have been lurking under the radar for months in animals? The virus starts spreading in those animals and then potentially can pop back into people. The famed virologist here in Canada working to figure out where Omicron came from and what's next. This is The National. As Canadian athletes gear up to go for the gold in Beijing in just over two weeks tonight, new questions about what they will face when they get there. China is not messing around with COVID-19. Safety protocols are strict and sweeping and being China, not up for debate. Tonight, we look at the serious concerns around two of those measures, China's mandatory Olympic app and its threats to online privacy and its unforgiving COVID-19 testing standards. CBC has learned the detection level is so high, it could prevent some Canadian athletes from competing even those previously cleared of the virus. Ellen Morrow has that story tonight. The final touches for Beijing 2022. Olympic rings on the ice as China puts a ring around the games. To keep COVID out, CBC has learned China will use extra sensitive PCR testing, more sensitive than what's commonly used in Canada and by major sports leagues. Some experts say it's too sensitive. You're going to pick up a lot of people that are probably not infectious. PCR tests come down to the so-called CT or cycle threshold value. Most places in Canada use a CT value of 35. But for the Olympics, PCR tests will have a CT value of 40, making them more able to pick up remnants of the virus. The concern is athletes who recovered from COVID weeks, even months prior, may still test positive when they arrive and be unable to compete. People that have recovered from COVID-19, they're all going to identify as positive or some of them will identify as positive in a foreign country going through isolation protocols. But are they transmissible? The answer is no. Yeah, Cassie! A positive COVID test was already the fear hanging over Canada's athletes desperate to perform. My plan for the next few weeks is just to stick to being at home and being at the ring. Right now, the plan that we have is to really get us the best chance of going over to Beijing and having a negative COVID test. So that's priority number one, because without that test, we, we can't even compete. China has been fierce in its fight against Omicron, locking down entire cities and mass testing tens of millions of residents. A test for the country itself will be to keep the Olympics safe. China has always been very careful and I mean, they've very dense populations. That and protecting its reputation may be behind the intense testing regimen for the Games, says uh, this virologist. The is, I think they want to keep an image of making sure that the Olympic are being taken, are being uh, done in a safe environment. Now athletes wait and hope the measure doesn't crush their Olympic dreams. Okay, so Alan, what are you hearing from the Canadian Olympic Committee about this? Well, Adrian, the COC is trying to calm nerves over this, as you can imagine. It put out a statement today saying that testing uh, in Beijing is meant to catch cases early and prevent transmission. It is not meant to unfairly exclude recovered athletes. It also says and pointed out there will be a panel of international medical experts at the game that will be considering positive cases, including these positives that might just be lingering false positives from old infections. But if you are an athlete who has recovered from a recent case, this is really the last thing you want hanging over you in your last few weeks of training. All right, Ellen Morrow in Toronto. Thank you, Ellen. So it's not just that strict testing. Everyone in the Olympic bubble in Beijing has to use a special app to keep Chinese health officials up to date on their COVID status. But as Katie Nicholson tells us, some security experts have already found a serious flaw. 
In just a few weeks, thousands will be logging on to Wi-Fi at Olympic venues like this. And when they do, they'll be using this app, My 2022. Many already are. The Beijing Organizing Committee requires participants to use it to upload daily COVID tests before the games begin. But cybersecurity think tank Citizen Lab says there's a security risk. Someone using this app can actually connect to um, like, a, like someone inter intercepting the traffic. Um, so they, they can read the traffic, um, they, can, they can modify it. When an app connects to a server, it usually first verifies the server's authenticity. So you don't accidentally connect to a fake server. Citizen Lab found this app doesn't follow that verification step, which means data can be intercepted by a malicious third party. You're inputting a lot of sensitive personal information, like your passport number. As bugs go, cyber experts say it's an easy one to fix. It's strange that that's not that, that's, uh, an issue on this app. And maybe the Chinese uh, authorities or the organization that's providing the app are working uh, to solve that. This app also features a currently dormant directory of blacklisted, politically sensitive words connected to topics like Tibet, the Uyghurs and Chinese leadership, which could be used to censor messages. It is uh, not uncommon for um, Chinese apps or a Chinese website uh, to have this list there when there are certain sensitive words popping up, uh, it will be flagged. It hasn't addressed the Citizen Lab report, but the Beijing Organizing Committee told Chinese state media the app passed review by Google, Apple and Samsung. As for Team Canada, they're leaving personal devices at home, but even on temporary phones, they will still have to use the app. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. For Canada's pandemic, with testing overwhelmed, COVID hospitalizations are one of the best indicators we have for how fast the virus is spreading. And that surge has reached another milestone. More than 10,000 patients hospitalized with the virus across Canada. Now, since December 26, the march to 10,000 has been relentless, up about 90%, so nearly doubling in the first week and again the following week. Since then, hospitalizations are still rising but at a slower rate, up less than 60%. So has it peaked? Too early to say when that will happen, but it will happen eventually, thanks to a number of factors, including restrictions. PEI has until recently been a COVID success story, hoping to avoid another lockdown. But as Kayla Hounslow explains, the island is now out of options. As of midnight, this business will be flipping this sign around all restaurants on Prince Edward Island forced to close to in-person dining. I'm hoping the numbers will go down. I've noticed that they keep climbing and today it was really high. In fact, the 407 cases reported on Tuesday are a new record. And until mid-December, PEI had never had a one-day total greater than 10. Often, the province reported zero new cases and it recorded its first two deaths on Friday. We had done extremely well and we never had the extent of COVID that other jurisdictions have had. And we had never had to deal with the reality of, of what COVID can do. But today, an admission that even this small island province, which has always acted quickly to keep COVID out, cannot stop Omicron. We are experiencing trends that are very concerning. With hospitalizations, ICU admissions and the test positivity rate all up, PEI is implementing tough new restrictions. Personal gatherings are limited to a single household only. However, up to two support people are allowed. Gyms, indoor recreation and schools will all be closed for two weeks. I had hoped that we would never be in a situation where we would have to implement even further restrictions. Eight people have been hospitalized with COVID-19. Four of them are in the ICU. That may not seem like a high number, but that's four of 20 ICU beds on the island, as long as there are enough staff to cover them. The Omicron has brought with it a, a fog that has made that finish line hard to find. Uh, and we need to do whatever we can do to slow it down until that fog lifts. The Premier is asking for patience. Just going to take it day by day. Day by day, with PEI now in a similar position as everyone else. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. In British Columbia, officials have extended restrictions, 
Organized indoor gatherings such as weddings and funerals will remain banned. Bars and nightclubs closed until at least February 16th. There is one exception. Gyms will be allowed to reopen this Thursday under strict capacity limits. Provinces and territories are rolling out booster shots. Not everyone seems to be rushing out to get them, though. So far, nearly 30 million Canadians have received two doses of a vaccine. Only about 12.6 million have gotten their third dose. Many just aren't eligible yet, but some are choosing to hold off. Renee Filipponi explains why. Jordan Power wants to make it clear he is not an anti-vaxxer. I decided to get my first two vaccines because um, I didn't want to put my grandparents at risk or uh, one of my best friends who's um, battling brain cancer right now. But he's holding back on getting the booster, believing as a young, healthy person, his risk of serious illness is low. But I'm a definitely a conscious person when it comes to really anything that I put into my body, um, especially something that I may not consider like natural right off the bat. Um, but at the end of the day, like I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor. And he's not alone. Despite the urgency of many to get boosters, more than 500,000 people in BC have received an invite for a third shot and have not responded. It's an issue across the country, and it's not just people questioning vaccines, says this scientist who educates people about them. A lot of people are starting to feel again the, the fatigue and exhaustion of just dealing with COVID, and for that reason, wanting to know why now they need to go get a third dose. Health officials urge people to get the booster to help prevent transmission and serious illness. It's not just about getting through this way. It's uh, that booster dose we now think is going to give us protection for whatever comes next in this pandemic. For those on board, there are mixed feelings about booster holdouts. Well, I can understand why they feel that way, but I have no regrets at all that we went and got our third dose, just feel a little bit more protected. To be polite, I wish I'd just go and get them. It's something Jordan Powers admits he will likely do. It's really just a matter of waiting and kind of seeing how things play out. And obviously, if uh, the government starts forcing people to take it, I don't really have much of a choice. And as the pandemic carries on, officials hope more people will see the benefit of the booster. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. WestJet is once again reducing flights due to Omicron. The company says it will cancel 20% of its flights through February. It blames a pandemic staffing crunch fueled by the new variant and the impact of what it calls government barriers to international travel. WestJet had already cancelled 15% of its flights this month. A staffing shortage is also why most flights at St. John's Airport were cancelled tonight, but not because of COVID. Several fire hall employees are on sick leave over what they call a toxic workplace. The union says its members have been harassed and bullied for flagging health and safety concerns. A CBC News investigation is digging into the history of a man named Robert Roche, known as the liquidator for buying, then shuttering, struggling businesses. He has been convicted of fraud and has racked up decades of debt. Now, after getting substantial government supports during the pandemic, more than a dozen former employees say he simply stopped paying them. Jonathan Gatehouse has the story. We feel stolen from. For Haley O'Brien, a job at PPE supply company Antiseptic Pro seemed like a good get during a pandemic. But soon she found herself among a group of 14 ex-employees, filing claims with Ontario's Labour Ministry for missing paychecks. It's wage theft. We want to know where this money's going. Kevin Lee was hired by Antiseptic Pro owner Rob Roche last summer to design a website. After asking about the month of pay he was owed, he was fired on the spot. Uh, well, it feels really disgusting. Documents obtained by CBC News show companies owned by Roche received at least $85,000 in government subsidies, from provincial and federal pandemic assistance to training grants for new hires, even as unpaid wage claims piled up against him. We tried to ask Roche about the complaints, but for weeks he deflected our interview requests. Yeah, I will get back to you shortly, OK? Even when we paid him a visit at his Toronto office. Hey, Mr. Raj. But that attempt did prompt him to send this video statement a day later, flanked by employees saying he's working on a deal with the province to repay the wages and that he's seeking a federal payroll audit. With reference to the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, we have asked the Canada Revenue Agency to conduct a trust 
account audit for the past two years to prove our transparency. Roche declined to provide documents to back up those claims. In a statement, Ontario's Ministry of Labour says investigations are ongoing, but confirmed it has issued 12 orders to pay so far. Court files show a pattern of unpaid wages and debts going back almost 30 years, and claims from former employees across Canada, including Manitoba, where Roche bought and shuttered Stylerite, a discount department store chain in 1995, throwing 400 people out of work. Records also reveal Roche has four separate fraud convictions, the last in 2001, netting him a year in jail. After a series of failed businesses in Europe, Antiseptic Pro is just the latest Canadian venture for Roche, following investments in everything from vocal coaching to Viagra sales, leaving his former employees to wonder how the liquidator can keep starting new companies without paying his old staff. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. If snow was yesterday's theme in much of Ontario and Quebec, shovels are today and plows and patience. Obviously, a huge cleanup effort is underway after a winter storm hit the region yesterday, shutting highways, clogging streets and closing schools. And as Karen Paul shows us, it will take time to work through. The day after the big dig. This tow truck driver has spent the last two days hauling out cars, semis, even ambulances. I've been doing this for more than 10 years now, but I've never, never seen this much uh, delays. Toronto and the surrounding area got up to 55 centimeters of snow. Schools were closed for a second day. People asked to stay home. Work is ongoing 24 hours a day until the job is done. With buses and streetcars running late, if at all, this man says it's easier to get around on his bike. I don't think they're shoveling very well downtown because people are not, you know, coming to work downtown that much. They're moving my car. Firefighters rescued this doctor after she abandoned her car in the height of the storm. She got towed and ticketed nearly $400. It's not the same as someone parking illegally on the street and their car got towed. I was advised by those firefighters to leave the car because it wouldn't have been safe for me to wait hours in the car freezing, you know, and uh, I, I had to get to work to um, see my patients. Near Ottawa, which got nearly half a meter of snow, a 33-year-old tow truck driver died while helping a stuck motorist. He was hit by a snowplow. Montreal only got 25 centimeters, but it's still a mess. I really don't know how I'm going to get out, this man says. Quite windy here. But there are some snow benefits. If kids still have time, they can uh, involve themselves uh, in the uh, snowman contest. There is one big question, what to do with all this snow? Some hard hit parts of Ontario are bracing for even more. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Toronto. We are getting a better sense tonight of the devastation from that volcanic eruption near the Pacific island nation of Tonga. So on your left, what it looked like before Saturday's eruption and after on your right, that difference in color is the thick layer of ash that is sitting on top of buildings, trees and runways. That is making relief efforts and communications difficult. At least three people were killed and all homes on one of Tonga's islands have been destroyed. But there is help on the way from Australia, New Zealand and the United Nations. Prime Minister Trudeau spoke with his cabinet tonight about developments in Ukraine, condemning the Russian military buildup on the border and urging a peaceful solution. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken goes tomorrow to Kyiv, where Canada's foreign affairs minister is tonight. Chris Brown shows us what's at stake. In what is shaping up as a pivotal week for diplomacy, Canada's Melanie Jolie met Canadian soldiers on a training mission in Ukraine. Nice to meet you, nice to meet you. As that country uh, stares down the threat from Russia on its borders. When a friend is going through difficult times, well, as a friend, we're there. Other friendly nations, such as the United States and Britain, have sent defensive weapons too, such as these Javelin anti-tank missiles. Jolie says Canada has been asked for similar help. We know that it is important uh, to play our part in the context, and therefore we're looking at options and we'll take a decision in a timely manner. 
Russia has now moved much of its army from as far away as Siberia to the border with Ukraine and even into neighboring Belarus. It's demanded NATO remove U.S. troops from Eastern Europe and never admit former Soviet states such as Ukraine. So the diplomatic pace has intensified. Germany, which buys vast amounts of natural gas from Russia, sent its new foreign minister to Moscow with a warning. Germany is ready to pay a high economic price to defend fundamental values, said Annalena Baerbock. A bipartisan delegation of U.S. senators visited Ukraine Monday, and the U.S. Secretary of State will visit Wednesday. The goal now, says this former British national security advisor, is to show that there are no cracks in the Western alliance and solidarity with Ukraine. I think there's a real effort going on to, to bolster and shore up the uh, Ukraine government. They've had a lot of erosion over the last couple of years, and of course that's precisely what the Russians are trying to do. Senior British and American officials warn the confrontation with Russia has reached a very dangerous point that some kind of an attack on Ukraine could come at any moment, but that doesn't mean diplomacy is pointless. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. There are worries in the United States that much anticipated 5G networks could disrupt air travel. Should an erroneous signal or, or something develop, it affects the, the aircraft systems. Coming up, why airlines are pushing back against the 5G rollout and winning. Plus. Shut the f up, Angie. We are so sick of your at negative narrative. A virologist faces vitriol as she investigates the origins of Omicron. The virus starts spreading in those animals and then potentially can pop back into people. And BC's highways are in such bad shape, truckers fear for their lives. It's not only that we are scared, it's our families that they are scared too. We are back into. Welcome back. 5G has been a kind of future tech buzzword for so long, it's easy to forget that 5G radio towers are already being rigged up everywhere, including near airports. Well, that has led to a warning from the U.S. aviation regulator. For certain planes, airports with 5G could be no-fly zones. As Susanna De Silva explains, the concern is they may not be safe. Grounded planes, paralyzed economy. The warning from U.S. airlines if 5G network towers came online, potentially interfering with the technology used to land planes. The 5G network is impinging or, or is starting to squeeze that range of reliability of the radar altimeter. And should an erroneous signal or, or something develop, it affects the, the aircraft systems such as uh, the automatic landing. 50. Experts say that could result in aborted landings and diversions. 5G towers all over the U.S. were supposed to be live tomorrow, but those near 50 airports are on pause after a last-minute deal. So everyone's looking at the agency, the FAA, and thinking, why did you wait this long? I think really what happened is we got to the, on the verge of deployment, and it probably dawned on a lot of people that once deployed, it's sort of a point of no return. In a statement today, President Biden thanked the telecom companies for the agreement that allows 90 percent of towers to operate, saying his team will continue to talk to airlines to, quote, chart a path forward for 5G deployment and aviation to safely coexist, adding they will continue to do so until we close the remaining gap and reach a permanent workable solution around these key airports. Despite the agreement, U.S. carrier AT&T expressed its impatience. We are frustrated by the FAA's inability to do what nearly 40 countries have done, which is to safely deploy 5G technology without disrupting aviation services, urging it to do so in a timely manner. Countries in Europe require lower power towers on frequencies that won't interfere with airplanes. In November, Transport Canada announced it would require 5G exclusion zones around the country's major airports as the issue continues to be studied. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Millions of American families have lost a financial lifeline. Their monthly child tax credit ran out or has been drastically reduced after a senator for West Virginia said he wouldn't support legislation extending it. Katie Simpson went there to see the impact. 
with some mm -hmm. claws. Just go in. Look away. Mm -hmm. In these sweet so moments with her son, inside. Kristen Olsen finds a brief reprieve by. from her anxieties. <laughs> She's one of the millions of American parents who'd come to rely on the child tax credit, monthly deposits of up to $300. It's not just that it helped make my ends meet, it's that it gave me peace of mind that my ends were going to meet. And then to yank it away, It just seems like a cruel joke. It what just, makes this just, even more difficult for Olson is the like role said, her elected representative things. played in allowing the, the program to expire. Credit. The child tax credit would have continued if the U.S. Senate had passed the president's massive social spending plan called Build Back Better. Joe Biden needed the support of all 50 Democrats, but there is just one holdout. Joe Manchin of West Virginia. I cannot vote to continue with this piece of legislation. I just can't. Manchin says the legislation would make inflation worse and costs too much money. This despite evidence showing residents in his home state, one of the poorest in the country, need financial assistance. 93% of kids in our state qualify for this benefit, uh, which kind of shows how, how widespread it is and how important it is here. Manchin's decision may be influenced by another factor, Donald Trump won West Virginia by nearly 40 points in the last election, meaning he's finding support in derailing Joe Biden's agenda. Well, I think he finally got a pair of cojones and did something right. Voters here aren't shy about their feelings. Overall, I'd say uh, he's done pretty well. He's tried to be his own man. I get emotional just thinking about it. Olson remains frustrated so even though she him. just qualified for a state grant that will help her with living he's costs until April. It doesn't solve her problems in the long run, and she fears no one cares. I hate to say that I just feel like it doesn't even matter what I would say to Joe Manchin about it, because he obviously does not give to... F about it, or about us, or about what's best for us, or about what's best for our children. Yes. Olson worries she'll lose her apartment when the grant runs out, but she'll figure it out, as so many American families are now left to do. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Charleston, West Virginia. An American scientist here in Canada investigating the next pandemic. Those conditions are really, really conducive to a virus spreading like wildfire if a virus gets into that population. Up next, the clues to the next big threat. And a little later, Canada approved Pfizer's COVID antiviral pill, but how will it be used? The doctors are here to explain. Welcome back. As we all aim to figure out where on earth Omicron is taking us, there are researchers in this country, some of the best in the world, dedicated to understanding some key mysteries about what's going on, how exactly Omicron developed, and what, God forbid, the next pandemic is all about. It's never been easy work, rarely work in the spotlight. Now it's work that might as well carry a warning label. <laughs> New boots, new job, new and really thick skin. Because brace yourselves, American virologist Angie Rasmussen has new fan mail. You are so addicted to people respecting you. I have to wonder, how empty is the rest of your life? Self-righteous, pompous, arrogant, dumb you are. Nice, eh? Saskatoon is now home after a move from New York. Not easy. Heading up a lab in Canada's Centre for Pandemic Research in a pandemic? Really not easy and choosing to talk, frankly, to hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers about COVID and vaccines, well, that's what draws all the online hate. Shut the up, Angie. We are so sick of your negative narrative. Go to hell, you inbred uh, I'm really sorry that you're getting all that. That's, it's not okay. I can give as good as I get. I try not to insult people personally. I always try to engage with ideas. I'm not going to allow them to take over my platform and amplify the nasty things they're saying. I'm gonna focus on amplifying the message that I think people need to hear. That message, hang in, limit your contacts, get vaccinated, crucially, get the rest of the world vaccinated. And to all levels of government here at home, she says step up even more. It's not so much the virus that surprised me, it's our inability to cope with it that has surprised me. 
certainly not about imposing lockdowns. It's about making it so that everybody has equal access to the tools they need to protect themselves. And I guess I'd say finally, making high quality masks available to every Canadian as well, um, especially making sure that rapid tests and those high quality masks are available in schools. Her confidence comes from a career studying viruses. This lab she now calls home is hiring for the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, or VEDO, will soon be one of only a handful in the world secure enough to study deadly new pathogens and how they jump from animals to humans. Speaking of which, let's talk Omicron. Do you have an understanding of Omicron's behavior now? When you look at the sequence of Omicron, it looks like the most recent ancestors of Omicron were actually SARS coronavirus 2 variants that were circulating in mid-2020. How did Omicron evolve without us noticing that Omicron was evolving? That it potentially was evolving in a population of people that isn't monitored closely. But given how transmissible Omicron is and how rapidly it's become the dominant variant in most of the world, it's really unlikely, I think, that, that it would fly below the radar for a year and a half and nobody would have picked it up. So what explains that gap? Where's this variant that's now such a staggering global menace been? Rasmussen's curiosity aligns with her research that just maybe the variant has been hiding elsewhere, maybe coursing through animals instead of humans. And if so, that's a problem. We could be looking potentially at future variants coming out of, out of what's called spillback or infection of animals from the human population the virus starts spreading in those animals and then potentially can pop back into people. And that is one hypothesis for where Omicron came from. But I don't know how worried I should be about what you're saying. So that's really why we're doing this work. Um, we're doing it to try to understand how worried we all should be. Now we know um, that, that COVID or SARS coronavirus 2 has already caused infections in white-tailed deer, um, both in Canada and in the United States. So we thought, you know, what about the other animals that are in Canada? SARS coronavirus 2, we're looking at receptors from a bunch of different animal species that we think might be able to, to actually permit infection of SARS coronavirus 2. And we're testing that in the lab to see if these animals can actually be susceptible to infection. So stay tuned. Stay tuned because after COVID-19, more pandemics are possible, maybe even likely. And Saskatchewan is an important place for research about what may come next. The province's economy intricately linked with agriculture. So if researchers identify which animals to worry about, they'll then work fast to find ways to protect both the animals and the economy for everyone's sake. Like what, what is the reason to, to be concerned about commercial farming in, in particular? Many really large farming operations keep animals, sometimes of different species, but in very, very close proximity. And those conditions are really, really conducive to a virus spreading like wildfire if a virus gets into that population. Now, this is already an economic problem for farmers when those are, are livestock diseases that can wipe out their entire herd or their entire flock. Um, but if it's a pathogen like, say, influenza that can go back and forth between some of these species and between humans, then it becomes what we call really a one health problem. This is work based in Canada, but with learnings for the whole world. And if it looks like Rasmussen hasn't really settled into her offices yet, it's just because there's no time. She needs to keep her eye on other viruses that may be lurking. If we have a pandemic that has a much higher case fatality rate than SARS coronavirus 2, which is comparatively very low uh, next to those other viruses, we are going to be in a world of trouble, and this pandemic is going to seem like a cakewalk in comparison. A scientist working with urgency on two fronts, in the lab and in the murk of the online world. Correcting misinformation, explaining the science over and over again, taking the insults and threats, and still pushing for more vaccines, more protections, and ultimately a bit of hope. The least I can do is, is help empower people with some information about that, and let them make their own good decisions about public health for them and their families with the, the best information that they possibly can. There is no such thing as a forever pandemic. It will at least become easier for us to be living with 
we should uh, start to enjoy the benefits of population immunity because enough of us have done the right thing and gotten vaccinated. And you've given Canadians an extraordinary education throughout all this. I just have to say to the national Canadian audience that I'm so grateful for how warmly I've been welcomed here. And I'm so glad to be putting down roots here. And, uh, and you know, thank you for welcoming me to your country. I'll try to, to live up to the expectations that have been set for me and that I've set for myself. And she really wants to emphasize that animals, she thinks, are the key. Her team is trying to understand a number of viruses that, say, can infect pigs, for example, but don't pass between humans very well right now. Staying on top of them and changes in them means being able to sound alarms well before it gets deadly for us. And coming up, Canadians have a new tool to help us in this pandemic. A COVID pill was just approved this week, but will it be useful for the fight against Omicron? I ask the doctors next. Health Canada approved Pfizer's new antiviral pill, Paxlovid, yesterday. But the question still remains, how will Canadians access it within the recommended five-day window? Joining us now to discuss what is next, infectious diseases specialist Dr. Isaac Bogosh and Dr. Susie Hoda. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Hoda, if you're someone who's eligible to take this, you have to do it in this, in this brief window. If you're vaccinated, sometimes the symptoms are like runny noses. You, you can't even get a PCR. How are you supposed to find out you have it, get the drug, and then start using it? Uh, it's an excellent question because, like you said, people can have very mild symptoms early on in infection, and particularly if they're vaccinated, may not even recognize that something's going on and the clock is ticking at that point. So that's one issue. And then another issue is, like you said, accessing PCR tests and eligibility criteria have changed quite a bit such that most people in the community are not able to access the test. So there are two barriers right there. And then on top of that, for people to understand if they're even eligible, um, you know, which would be what triggers getting a test. You know, you have to self-identify, am I at a high-risk group to actually benefit or be eligible to get this, um, this treatment? And so there's another barrier. So if there's lots of things in the way, that's going to require the healthcare system to pivot in some capacity. Dr. Bogosh, how does that happen? Well, I think that you would offer this medication in multiple venues to enable the greatest chance for success. You'd want this in primary care clinics, you'd want this in emergency departments, and you'd want this in pharmacies. These are places that have testing available on site, have people who can perform the test and interpret the results, for example, if you're using a rapid test on site and who can initiate the medication on site, but while also having a good understanding of the person who's coming in, their medical uh, history, uh, understanding any potential drug interactions, and being able to dispense the medication to an eligible person. You mentioned, though, that, that there are drug interactions. So, Dr. Hoda, can we, can we walk through that? Who, who could not take this? There are a large number of potential drug interactions because of the way that one part of this medication works. Um, and so it really does require a thorough uh, review with a pharmacist or whoever is aware of your medications to know if something really important that you're taking, say a cardiac medication, um, could interact with this. And with other uh, types of medications like blood thinners, it may change the levels of uh, blood thinner in your, your blood as well. So adjustments might have to be made to your current medications. And in some cases, it may not be a good option to take this medication uh, because of those interactions. And finally, with chronic kidney disease, there has to be a dose adjustment for some individuals. So, you know, I think it's not so straightforward as here's a pill, I, I want it, I'm eligible, please give it to me. I, it takes a, a more thorough review. You. Dr. Bogosh, anything you want to add about who can't do this? No, I agree with Dr. Hoda. It's not Halloween candy we're giving out. It's a medication, and you have to have a good understanding of the patient and the drug to make sure that you're providing the best course of therapy for the right person. One last question here. If some of the people who are eligible to take this are the unvaccinated because they would be at higher risk, what is the incentive then for someone who isn't vaccinated and isn't interested in in getting the shot, hasn't been convinced so far to now take it. Well, I, I would start off by saying this cannot be a replacement for vaccination. Um, you know, this is another thing that can be added to our strategies to try and manage COVID, but it doesn't replace vaccination. And here's why. I mean, vaccines will provide durable protection and they've actually shown 
They protect it against severe illness across variants. And also, you know, they protect you at the time that you're ill. They protect you now, they protect you later. There's no guarantee that you're gonna have access, as we've talked about, to these medications at the time that you need them or, you know, be able to fit within that five-day time window. Okay. Dr. Hoda, Dr. Bogosh, as always, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. After massive floods followed by snow and ice, BC's roads are in disrepair. If the road conditions don't have improve, so many people would want to park their trucks. More than an annoyance, drivers say it is dangerous. Plus. This is the first time I've ever tried this. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Okay, okay, hitting the tennis court on ice. Some are hoping the sport is here to stay. BC's main highway into the interior is set to reopen tomorrow to regular traffic. The Coquihalla was closed for weeks to repair extensive damage caused by November's floods, but there are still some pretty big issues with roads elsewhere in the province. And as Renee Filipponi shows us, that has left some drivers worried for their safety. A moment to pray before hitting BC highways. It's become a ritual for some truck drivers. It's not only that we are scared, it's our families that they are scared too. Our kids come and hug us and we can see in their eyes the answer they want. Will you be back? Along with snow and ice, Vijadeep Singh Sahasi says conditions on the roads have severely deteriorated. There are the potholes that are so big that if the truck hits them, obviously we lose the balance. You know, it, it scares us down and it's a danger for the other users of the road as well. Some of his colleagues have died. If the road conditions don't have improve, so many people would want to park their trucks. These are the highways truckers rely on every day. Heavily damaged by floods and freezing temperatures in the past three months. The province says repairing them is a top priority. Wet conditions under the roadbed that then freezes and cracks and we know that uh, those repairs are really important. But it's not just major highways that are crumbling. Potholes have been wreaking havoc for weeks across the province. It can get quite big and then um, as a result some people uh, may pop a tire or uh, do rim damage to their vehicle. To prevent that, crews in Burnaby have been working tirelessly to patch up holes. With all the uh, water and the rain we've had and all the snow and the melting and then all the freeze thaw going on, we've had it's, it's, it's definitely taken a, a toll on our roads this year. Just more damage to fix following months of weather that has so much of the province still in recovery mode. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. A big change is on the way at CBC Radio's As It Happens. Hello, I'm Carol Off. And Carol Off announced today she is stepping down as host after nearly 16 years with the show. She told listeners it's time to move on. She will host her final program on February 25th, then begin work on a new summer series for CBC. Canadian hockey legend Willie O'Ree was honoured tonight. The first black player in NHL history had his number 22 retired by the Boston Bruins and raised to the rafters. O'Ree entered the game in 1958. 60 years later, he was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. The Prime Minister was among many who recorded videos congratulating him. And who says you have to give up tennis in the winter? Is that first, like, what? Tennis on ice? Is that a thing? You know, everyone, everyone's curious about that. It is apparently a thing, a very Canadian solution coming up next in our moment. If you love tennis but have to give it up every winter, an Edmonton man has the solution for you. So strap on some skates and take tennis to the rink. Yes, ice tennis. That is a very Canadian idea. And that's our moment. Once the season ends for tennis, the snow hits, you can't really be, uh, you, can't, you can't play anymore and that's it. So I thought, why not combining those two and actually playing, you know, ice tennis, show how Canadian we really are. <laughs> you can either be on uh, shoe studs or you can be on skates. This is the first time I've ever tried this. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I originally thought it was without skates, just on a really slippery surface, but I was still down to try it. Now that I'm here, I'm glad I did. It's really great how many people showed up today. 
you know, seeing all the smiles and them trying it their hardest. I think it gets their attention. So they're first like, what? Tennis on ice? Is that a thing? You know, everyone, everyone's curious about that. They love it. They're like, they, they want to be back. So I just, I can't wait for them to be back too. And it'd be fun. So I am all in for this. I cannot skate to save my life, but I love tennis. So helmet, mouth guard, elbow pads, knee pads. If I can still move after that, I'm in. That is the National for January the 18th. Good night.